Good afternoon and welcome to uh, this lecture on antibiotic resistance. My name is Martin Welch, I'm a reader in microbial physiology and metabolism here in the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge. But it's an absolute pleasure to do what I do. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy my, 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 my job. I never wake up in the morning thinking, oh no, not another day. So being a scientist, working on important problems, internationally significant problems like this, is something that I find really exciting and uh, enthusiastic about it, to say the very least. So today I want to <coughs> talk to you about antibiotic resistance and the rise of the superbug. Now, we've all seen the lurid headlines which are out there in the, in the, in the press about the age of the apocalypse, back to the dark ages of medicine because antibiotics are are uh, in, becoming increasingly uh, uh, scarce that will actually work on these bugs. What I want to do today is just scratch below the surface of these lurid headlines and investigate what superbugs really are, what antibiotic resistance really is. So if we begin with the basics. We live in a bacterial world. We are surrounded by bacteria. You take a single gram of, of soil from your garden, it will contain a hundred million bacteria inside it. And these bacteria are, for the most part, relatively harmless to us, but some of them are professional pathogens. Not necessarily that we encounter them very often. Things like Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of plague, is what we might call a professional pathogen. That's very rare. More common though, are what we call opportunistic pathogens. These are the kind of bugs that are around us in the environment all the time, and we encounter all the time. Most of the time, they cause us no problems, but if given half an opportunity, half a chance, they can get into us. We've got a nice, warm mammalian body, rich in nutrients, they'd like to colonize it, and they can potentially cause disease. So what stops that? Well, what stops that is right in front of you here, your immune system which is an inordinately powerful way of controlling bacterial infection, as well as viral infection and fungal infection. Now the immune system comprises essentially two, uh, two parts. You can see over here on the left-hand side is a cell, a white blood cell, which is producing these uh, pseudopodia, as they're called, picking up bacteria, engulfing the bacteria, and frying them in a superoxide soup. On the right hand side, you can see the second component of the immune system. This is the antibodies which will bind to the surface of bacteria and other pathogens, mark them out for destruction by white blood cells. So this, this system, the immune system, does an amazing job, an absolutely incredible job. It, it protects us most of the time from this wealth of bacteria that are around there in the environment. Now, unfortunately, sometimes the immune system fails to clear the pathogen. And this can lead to colonization and then infection. You can see that on the slide in front of you. Various different types of infections are highlighted here, for example, respiratory infections, rather common. On the top right hand side, you can see septicemia. This is bacteria in your bloodstream. Uh, more common, the one that most of us have encountered most of the time is shown in the bottom right there. That's soft tissue infection, things like streptococcal throat and what have you. Now this is where antibiotics come in. So what do antibiotics actually do? A common misconception is that the antibiotics are there clearing the infection. That's not true. What the antibiotics do is they, they, they destroy enough of the bacteria that are in the system to give the immune system the upper hand, a chance to clear the infection for us. So, they're really helping the immune system, giving it a window of opportunity to clear that bacterial infection. You can see a rather stylized uh, image on the right hand side here of some antibiotic penicillin like antibiotics breaking up the cell wall with the bacteria. And that's actually what happens. On the left hand side, you can see uh, an electron micrograph of a bacterium that's been treated with a penicillin like antibiotic. And you can see it's spilling out its cytoplasm. There's been a rupture in the cell wall here created by the antibiotic action and it's spilling out its insides and dying. So what do antibiotics actually do? How do they act? Well, that's very simple to explain. Antibiotics target or inhibit essential processes in the bacteria. So there are a number of 
essential processes, including DNA replication, cell wall synthesis, the production of proteins by the ribosome in the cell. And these are absolutely central to the, to, to the organism. If you inhibit the ability to replicate DNA, the cell dies. If you inhibit the ability to make cell walls, as we saw in the previous slide, the cell pops open and dies, it lies it. If you inhibit the ability to make proteins, the cell dies. So that's what antibiotics do. They target these absolutely fundamentally essential processes in the cell. So why is it a problem? Well, it's all fine, but the bugs are fighting back. We're seeing an increasing number of bacteria become antibiotic resistant. And this is shown on the image in front of you here. There's two maps side by side. The left hand side is a map of Europe, and uh, it shows the distribution of E. coli isolated from hospitals in the community. And those E. coli are resistant to something called cephalosporins. This is a class of, of, of antibiotic that breaks open the cell wall, as we saw earlier. So you can see in 2009, there was a relatively low incidence, around about five to 10% of cephalosporin resistant E. coli in Europe. Four years later, just four years later, you can see that the map is dominated by oranges and reds. The orange indicates 10 to, and the reds, 10 to 25% uh, uh, incidence of resistant E. coli. So just in the space of four years, we can see it's become a major problem. That antibiotic won't work for these bacteria. How do bugs become resistant to antibiotics? Well, they do it in lots of different ways. The antibiotic has to get into the cell to start off with. So one me mechanism of resistance is to make it more difficult for the antibiotic to get into the cell. Once it gets in, the antibody, antibiotic can be effluxed out. It can be pumped out of the cell. You can modify the target of those antibiotics. I've said that they target essential cell processes, like DNA replication, cell wall synthesis. If you alter the targets to which those antibiotics bind, you can become resistant. And also you can inactivate the antibiotic. That antibiotic class that I talked about earlier that causes cell walls to, to lies and, and, and kill the cells, the most common resistance mechanism to that class of antibiotics, the beta-lactams, is enzymes that will break down and digest the antibiotic itself. We'll come back to those perhaps in a slide or two's time. But the real problem is that these resistance mechanisms, and there are, as we've seen, many of them, these resistance mechanisms are very easily spread between bacteria. So bacteria like to take up DNA from the environment. This is called transformation. And if that DNA that they're taking up happens to encode, genes which confer antibiotic resistance. That's one way in which the recipient organism, the recipient bug, can become resistant to antibiotics. There are also things called phage, and we will come back to those. They're viruses that attack bacteria, but they also act as carriers of DNA from one bacterium to another. So if that phage happens to be carrying an antibiotic resistance gene, it can transfer it from one species of bacterium to another. And finally, bacteria like sex, they like to transfer their DNA directly from a donor organism into a recipient organism. And that way they can transfer antibiotic resistance too. So these mechanisms of what we call horizontal gene transfer allow these resistance mechanisms, which are acquired by bacteria, to spread and disseminate throughout the population very, very rapidly. So where does resistance come from in the first place? Antibiotics as a class of molecules were only really developed in the 1930s and 1940s. So where did that resistance come from? Well, in spite of the confidence of some early workers in the field that because antibiotics target essential cell processes, resistance won't arise, this was probably not gonna be the case. In fact, even Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, realized very early on that antibiotic resistance would likely be commonplace. And the reason for this is we have to think about where antibiotics actually come from. Now antibiotics are produced naturally in the soil by soil bacteria, molds, streptomyces, things like that. But it's thought that those antibiotics are produced by these species to kill off other bacteria in the, in the surroundings 
protecting the niche, if you like. Now, if you're a bacterium and you're making an antibiotic, the very last thing that you want is for that antibiotic that you're producing to kill you. So it makes good, actually, the centric sense anyway, that if you're making an antibiotic, you will also make a mechanism of resistance that means that you, the producing organism, are resistant against that antibiotic that you're making. And as I said in the previous slide, these mechanisms of resistance can be readily transferred through horizontal gene transfer to other organisms in the neighborhood. So one solution to that surely is to make entirely synthetic antibiotics. Compounds that, that the natural world has never seen before, that have been dreamt up in the mind of the organic chemist. Well, one such compound is the fluoroquinolones. This was, in fact, still is a very widely used antibiotic in the clinic. I believe it's the second or third most widely used antibiotic on the planet. However, ciprofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone, you can see it there on the slide, started to go into clinical trials in the mid 1980s. And very soon after, people began to notice ciprofloxacin resistance was arising in all sorts of islets, Staphylococcal aureus islets, E. coli islets, that kind of thing. And in fact, genomic studies have shown that if you look at the map in front of you, in 1986, when clinical trials first began, that is actually when resistance was first observed. And that resistance spread in the way you can see on the slide there, between 92, 98, 2004, spread across the United Kingdom. And the ironic thing is that resistance probably began with those clinical trials. So as soon as the antibiotic came into clinical use, and it is, I will still say, a very effective antibiotic, resistance began to arise. Now this is a slide I want to dwell on for a couple of minutes. It's one of the most important ones in the series that I'm presenting here. All it shows is the percentage of deaths due to infectious disease over the last 150 years or so. These data come from Massachusetts in the United States, but a very similar set of data could be derived for any major Western industrialized city, London, Paris, Berlin, what have you. And what we can see here is that there were there's a very high incidence of death due to infectious disease. This includes bacterial disease, viral disease, fungal disease, all the way through until the end of the 19th century. And then we start to see a continual decline in infectious disease until we get to uh, the middle of the 20th century where it's remained relatively constant, bumping along the bottom there, rather low values. This spike in the middle here is the 1918 flu epidemic. So what, who do we have to thank for this? Well, I've shown there in the, in, the, in the blue rectangle, that's when antibiotics were really introduced. And you can see that by the time antibiotics were introduced, we were already on the downward slope, nearly at the bottom of that slope. In fact, most of the driver behind this downward trend has been the Victorian philanthropists and the city planners that provided improved sewerage, education for the population, keeping clean, good hygiene, that kind of thing. And improved hygiene in hospitals, recognition about the importance of, 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 of good hygiene and sterility in operations in hospitals and so on and so forth. So that's had a much larger impact on the overall pattern of, of, of death through infectious disease than antibiotics have had. Which does raise the question, going back to these lurid headlines right at the start where I began this lecture, is this really a problem? Well, the answer is yes. But I think before we get to the reason why the answer is yes, we need to think about, 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 about when we use antibiotics. If antibiotics stop working tomorrow, how many of us would notice? Well, most of us, most of the time, are not popping antibiotics down, we're not taking antibiotic pills. When we do take antibiotics, very often it's uh, uh, to help to facilitate or accelerate uh, removing an infection, an ear infection or throat infection that would resolve itself anyway, given a period of weeks or a few weeks. We get back to work a little bit quicker. Now, for most of us, most of the time, uh, antibiotics, uh, uh, play a very little role in our lives. There is a small percentage of the population that are very high dependency users, 
But what we've got, really got to ask ourselves is, where are antibiotics actually important? Why would we notice when they disappear? And I think the answer to that is something you have to think about. It's in operations, even routine operations, minor operations, would become potentially life-limiting, life-threatening, life I beg your pardon, in the absence of antibiotics. Antibiotics are great prophylactics to prevent infection in that scenario. So that's where we'll notice them. Of course, I've talked there mostly about the industrialized world, us. Uh, we don't tend to suffer from those infectious diseases from uh, uh, professional pathogens and, uh, and opportunistic pathogens as well. We can, we can control those relatively well. So we're in a very good state. But if you think about the developing world, the lower to middle income countries, their infectious disease is much more of a problem. Good sanitation, uh, sewerage, clean water, that kind of thing. Those are privileges that we have and they don't. So we really need antibiotics also for that set of the population, the rest of the world, if you like. It's also worth pointing out at this stage, just before I leave this slide, that we're also facing some resurgent infectious diseases. Tuberculosis had almost disappeared 20, 30 years ago, and now it's coming back with a vengeance. And the drugs aren't working on some of those strains of tuberculosis. There are lots of strains of, of mycobacterium tuberculosis that are multi-drug resistant, so we urgently need new antibiotics for them as well. So, solution. Let's just make more antibiotics. That should be fairly straightforward, right? Well, I'm showing you here on this slide the kind of evolution of antibiotic development. You can see the golden age of antibiotics was in the mid 50s. And ever since that time, we've had fewer and fewer and fewer antibiotics that are coming onto the market. Since the 1990s, there's been this so-called discovery void where very few antibiotics, new classes of antibiotics in particular, have come onto the market. So it's not straightforward to make antibiotics. It also costs a lot to bring an antibiotic to market. And you have to think about this in terms of the companies that actually make these antibiotics. These are commercial companies. And they've got other, thing, other ways to invest their, uh, uh, their expertise. Why would you possibly invest lots of money in producing an antibiotic where if you take a week's dose of it, you get better, all right? So the drug company gets some money from that week's dose, but then you're better. There are much better targets if you're a company trying to make a profit out there. Chronic diseases of Western society, like diabetes, certain types of cancer, obesity. These are long-term diseases where you, whoever's taking those pills or those medications are tied in for the long term. You tend to make more profit that way. So there's not so much of an incentive for many companies to invest large amounts of money in identifying new antibiotics. And large amounts of money it does cost. Here's an example, the GlaxoSmithKline experience. In the mid 1990s, towards uh, the mid 90s, towards the, the noughties, over a seven year period, Glaxo invested hundreds of millions of dollars in high throughput campaigns, looking for small compounds, new drugs that might target essential bacterial processes. Half a million small molecules were screened, and in the end of that gargantuan, very costly effort, no tractable leads. So other companies looked at that and they thought, no, we don't really want to go down that route. Right, so new antibiotics are hard to come by, but I will come back to that towards the end. Uh, why not target or inhibit the resistance mechanisms that make, anti uh, that make uh, uh, bacteria resistant to antibiotics? Well, that's already been done. That's not a, a new idea. You can see here in front of you, there's this compound called clavulanic acid, which comes again from a soil organism, a streptomyces clavuligerus. And what that does, that compound inhibits the enzyme that breaks down penicillin-like antibiotics. So that can be applied and very frequently is applied with penicillin-like antibiotics called beta-lactams so that the beta-lactams work, the penicillins work, and the resistance mechanism, if it's there, is inhibited. So that is a way forward. 
Another approach, and this is something that I get very excited about, is to target intercellular bacterial communications. Now it turns out that for the last 150 years, microbiologists have been studying the wrong thing. We've been studying suspensions of bacteria growing in flasks, colonies growing on agar plates. But it turns out that most bacteria spend most of their time in neither of those two growth modes. In fact, they spend most of their time attached to solid surfaces where they form sticky aggregates called biofilms. Now, those biofilms have been known about since the 1930s. We've known all about those, but it wasn't until around about 1990 or thereabouts that we began to realize the clinical importance of biofilms, because it turns out that biofilms, because they're covered in a sticky uh, a coat of a, a polymeric matrix that the bacteria make, are very resistant to antibiotics, intrinsically resistant to antibiotics. So you can throw a very high dose of antibiotics at a biofilm and it, it, it won't even feel it, it'll carry on growing. Now, the real interesting thing I think about this is that we now know that the formation of these biofilms, these multicellular communities, is controlled by a form of cell-to-cell -cell communication. Now, by communication, I don't mean, that, of course, the bacteria, they don't have a brain, they don't have a mouth, they can't talk to one another, it's chemical communication. So there's a chemical communication between cells. When they reach a certain population cell density, this chemical communication tells the cells to start hunkering down, start producing this polymeric matrix and start forming a biofilm. Now that's interesting because if you think about it, if we can block the formation, if we can block that, that chemical cell to cell communication and prevent the cells from forming biofilms, they will remain in a free living so-called planktonic form and that form is sensitive to antibiotics. So we can potentially resensitize uh, the system to conventional antibiotics by preventing biofilm formation. And drugs which target this cell to cell communication mechanism are something that my lab is very, very interested in. Another approach which has proven very useful is to target bacterial cells with these viruses. I briefly mentioned them earlier, they're called bacteriophage. Phage means to eat. And what bacteriophage are, are viruses. You can see them on the slide in front of you here. They look like little spaceships coming down. They dock onto the surface of the bacterium. They inject some DNA. And once they've injected their DNA into the bacterium, this reprograms the bacterium to make more viruses. And those viruses eventually burst out of the cell and kill the cell. Now, the nice thing is that these viruses, these bacteriophage, are very, very specific to certain pathogens. They recognize very specific receptors on the cell surface. And when the antibiotics stop working and there's nothing else left, and that was the case for this young lady up here. She's a cystic fibrosis patient. She got infected with a particularly nasty uh, uh, species of bacterium called Mycobacterium abscessus. She looked as if she was going to die. She had a lung transplant and that transplant was infected with the abscessus. The only way forward was to treat her with these bacteriophage. It took a lot of effort and people pulled out all the stops, but it worked brilliantly. She's alive. So why is it so difficult to identify new antibiotics? Well, the reason for that is that chemical space, if you like, is huge. The more atoms that you have in a molecule, the more different ways there are of putting those atoms together, the more different combinations you have. And you can see that here on the left hand side, this is the log of the number of molecules that you can make from a certain number of atoms shown in the bottom there. Now a log means, for example, log 20 means 10 with 20 zeros behind it. 30 means, log 30 means 30, uh, 10 with 30 zeros behind it, and so on and so forth. And you can see that as you increase the number of atoms in a molecule, the number of different combinations of those atoms to make new molecules goes up exponentially. Now that's important because actually we don't really, most of the time, want these little molecules over here. Little molecules are sometimes very bioactive, but they're usually not particularly specific. In order to have very tight binding of a molecule to the target, tight binding of an antibiotic to the target, generally speaking, it needs to be moderately large. It needs to have a molecular weight of somewhere 500 to 1,000 Dalton. 
the larger the molecule, the more chemical space that you need to screen through. One solution to this is actually to use these things called fragment libraries over here. Let me just say a bit about that. So this is a molecule. You can see it in the top left there. It's something that some collaborators of ours uh, uh, produced. It's called Gemosin. It's an inhibitor of dihydrofolopeductase, an essential enzyme in the bacterial cell. It's called Gemosin, by the way, because the postdoc that made it was called Gemma, and it has a partner called Emerson. The person that made that one, of course, was called Emma. Now, if you look at Gemosin, the structure over here, you can kind of theoretically break it down into the different chemical moieties or different chemical bits that you can see down below there. So this bit is a fragment of germicin. This bit is a fragment of germicin, if you like. And if you take these fragments, you can test them to see whether they bind to a given target. Now they will bind with lower affinity, as I said before. If you have more complex molecules, there's more bits of them to bind to the target. So they tend to bind with higher affinity. Whereas these fragments tend to bind with rather low affinity. But if you get any binding at all, what you can do is if you can prove, for example, that there's a bit that binds there and a bit that binds there, you can ask your chemist friends to link those two together and make something which is a bit more complicated that will bind with a slightly higher affinity. And in that way, you can grow the molecule, if you like. This requires quite a bit of knowledge, but you can grow the molecule to make a higher affinity, higher specificity, uh, potential new antibacterial agent. So I want to just end up by giving you an example of the application of that fragment-based drug discovery approach to a real-world problem. My bacterium, the one that I work on in my laboratory, is called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Most people have never heard of it. However, the World Health Organization uh, about two or three years ago, put it up at the top of its list of critical priority pathogens against which we urgently need new antimicrobial agents. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an opportunistic human pathogen. It's one of those things that we encounter all the time, but if it happens to get in past the first line of the immune defense and establish an infection, it can kill you within a week. It's very common in Burns patients, diabetic foot ulcers, as you can see here, apologies for the image, it is a bit gruesome, but diabetic foot ulcers are often also uh, often infected with pseudomonas. Cancer patients and other immune impaired patients uh, will be at more risk of pseudomonas infection. The area that I work on in particular is people with cystic fibrosis. This is a genetic disease, but that genetic disease predisposes uh, these individuals towards infection, particularly by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And those infections can become life-limiting. So how are we using fragment-based drug discovery in order to try and find better ways of killing Pseudomonas aeruginosa? Well, it turns out that in many infection scenarios, those infection sites contain high concentrations of a little compound called propionic acid. It's very, very common. It is produced as a byproduct of metabolism by many bacteria and many other physiological processes. In fact, we use propionic acid very commonly in the human world as a food preservative. The thing is, if Pseudomonas aeruginosa can't detoxify propionic acid, it dies. This small molecule, propionic acid, is lethal to Pseudomonas, but the Pseudomonas has evolved uh, a pathway, you can see it, it's shown up here in front of you. Don't pollute your minds worrying about the details of the pathway, but it's evolved a pathway which can detoxify propionic acid and in fact turn it into something quite useful to the cell. So it's a bit of a no-brainer that if we can target that detoxification pathway with antimicrobial agents, enzyme inhibitors, we can stop Pseudomonas aeruginosa growing in any environment, and as I say, there are many environments that contain propionic acid. You can see that down here below. These are just mutants, which are defective in a couple of parts of this pathway up here. If we knock out, for example, this enzyme, something called PRPC, you can see that on the, in the presence of propionate, there's no growth of that mutant. So this is a good proof of principle that actually this is a good target. So to cut a very long story short, and just to, to wind up before we go to the Q&A,
We've been using fragment-based drug discovery to try and identify inhibitors of that enzyme, PRPC, and some other enzymes in the pathway, which have the potential to be new antibacterial agents. And you can see one here in the uh, diagram in front of you in green and red there. That's one of the fragments that we've identified that's actually rather a good inhibitor of the enzyme. It was grown from smaller fragments. This is the substrate of the enzyme up here. And the next step that we're currently engaged in is just to grow our fragment here and link it up with something that looks like the substrate to make a better binder, if you like. And those uh, studies are moving forward very nicely indeed. So I'll just wind up at this point. I hope I've introduced you some, uh, 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 or given you some background as to where antibiotic resistance comes from, what antibiotics do, and how we can potentially identify new antimicrobial agents. My funders, who I have to acknowledge, are outlined on the bottom there, and I'd also like to highlight uh, the Cambridge Infectious Diseases Consortium, which is a, 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 an umbrella group within the university that puts a lot of effort into uh, linking people together, linking chemists and biologists and physicists and people involved in designing hospitals, for example, getting us together to reduce infection rates by uh, infectious disease. Okay. Uh, this event has been uh, recorded and it will be available for people to watch at a later date. Um, I'm happy for you to email uh, questions after the event. I'll do my best to answer those. Um, but for now, I will just uh, um, end the show and ask if anybody has any questions which you can submit in the usual way. Thank you. So. I have to. I, here we go. Q and A. So I've got quite a few questions here. Oh, that's a good one. Is MRSA a bacterium or a virus? Well, it's a bacterium. It means MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And Staphylococcus aureus is one of these opportunistic pathogens. We find it on skin on the surfaces of, of door handles everywhere it's very very common but mrsa is a, a rather special variant of that which is resistant to a class of antibiotics called the beta lactam antibiotics and mrsa is, is actually quite widespread quite a few of us carry it around on our bodies anyway uh, it seems that the intro is another good question. The introduction of antibiotics did not significantly change the slope of the graph. No, it didn't. Uh, anti if you look in very, very close detail, you can see the impact of antibiotics on health. There is a, there is a, 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 a minor improvement there. But by and large, the point I'm trying to make there is Actually, the reason why we are not popping antibiotics all the time is because we are fit, we are healthy, and that's due to things like uh, improvements in sewerage, improvements in general hygiene, and a recognition of this. So education has had a major impact. If you go to the developing world where the provision of clean water is still a problem, uh, the, the disposal of human waste is still a problem for various reasons. That's where the infections are still rife, and those, that's a community that desperately needs antibiotics to be rolled out. Ah, that's another good question. The role of vaccines in reducing deaths by infections. Yes, vaccines are great, and obviously these are a, a very um, important right at the moment, especially with the coronavirus uh, issue that we're all having to face. Vaccines for bacterial infections, um, Yes, they're very important, and yes, they do play an important role, but um, uh, possibly less so than, as I've said, maintenance of a clean environment and an awareness of how bacterial infection uh, uh, forms. Vaccines probably generally going to be better on a wide scale against viral infections, but it's a very good question. What is a professional pathogen? That is another great question. A professional pathogen would be something like Yersinia pestis. 
the causative agent of plague, or you could say mycobacterium tuberculosis, the causative agent of tuberculosis. These are pathogens where, as far as we can see, there may be reservoirs out there in the wild, but principally, most of these organisms are, are identified from human infections. And they seem to, these organisms seem to have evolved over time to really be specialists in human, or should we say mammalian infections. Their goal in life, their principal goal in life, is to infect. Now, they're not inherently malevolent organisms. They're not evil. No. All they're looking for is, is nutrient and a, a vehicle by which to disseminate. So we, we mustn't think of these things anthropocentrically. They are, they are simply wanting to find somewhere that they can multiply, they can find nutrition and, uh, and then disseminate. So that's a, that's a great question. I really like that. Um, does the chronological profile of death through infectious disease also apply in the developing world? If not, how would it differ? And are they likely to follow the path of developed countries? Well, yes, is the answer. In the developing world, infectious disease is still rife. Um, antibiotics are often used to, uh, to treat those infections, but antibiotic use in such developing countries is often not as well regulated as it is over here. So for example, in Southeast Asia, you can go into your average pharmacy and you can buy antibiotics over the counter. And this is one of the drivers of the dissemination and spread of resistance mechanisms, especially in a globalized world. So these resistance mechanisms, they, they, they originate somewhere in the world and then they get spread through global travel. And it's a, it's a major problem. Uh, of course, just going back to that, that question, uh, if they follow, if those uh, lower middle income countries follow the path of developed countries, of course this will improve things. Those countries are in urgent need of infrastructural investment and education to improve hygiene. And that, as I pointed out, is crucial, absolutely crucial. Uh, let's have a look. What does ligandability mean? Ooh, that's a good question. Like a, a ligand is a small molecule like an antibiotic that will bind to something else. In our case, an enzyme or a protein inside the cell. So it's simply a small molecule binding to a protein in the cell. And ligandability uh, just means, I suppose, how, how well uh, a, a, a particular small molecule will act as a ligand to bind to its target. Uh, let's have a look. Is there any wisdom in trying to alter the surface characteristics on which uh, the bacterial colonies form so their aggregation loosens? Yes, is the answer. This is an area that is receiving a lot of attention. Antibacterial surface is not necessarily, uh, 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 doesn't really apply for the most part in the, in the human body because these are biotic surfaces we're talking about, the inside of a lung, the alveoli and the mucus layer inside the alveoli, that's where the bacteria is sticking to form biofilms. But clinically, it is important. For example, there are surgical implants. Uh, these are used very widely. And those surgical implants can have biofilm formation over the surface, particularly by Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And once you have that colonization of the surface, uh, you have a problem. So if you can make surfaces of implants, that have a lower ability to stick to bacteria or the bacteria have, have less of an affinity for those surfaces, this is certainly going to help. Does the current best advice remain to finish a course of the antibiotic, usually five days? Um, well, the answer to that is yes. Uh, sometimes people will take an antibiotic course and they'll stop taking the antibiotic course, course once they feel better. That's not a good idea. Of course, antibiotics are not a, a panacea. There are downsides to taking antibiotics. So antibiotics are a bit of a blunt instrument, actually. They're, they're, they're not particularly targeted. And if you take antibiotics at very high doses all the time, this will affect the bacteria in your GI tract. And the bacteria in your GI tract are really important. They help to provide you with vitamin B and they assist in iron uptake. And it's now, 
very clear that the composition of the microbiota in your gut has a, a, a knock-on effect on many other uh, physiological processes in us. But yes, the best advice is finish the course of antibiotics um, uh, uh, as prescribed. Uh, let's have a look. There's lots of questions. Um, oh, this is a good one. Would it help to incentivize drug companies by giving a large reward to those who develop new effective antibiotics? Yes, it certainly would. And that has been uh, uh, one of the ways in which the European Union has been trying to catalyze uh, industrial involvement in these areas by uh, exactly that process to make it more attractive for these companies to engage in antibiotic production. Um, you describe the use of bacteriophage in the case of the young girl with CF. How available are bacteriophage and how much work is being done to produce them in different bacteria? Are they the future? Well, the answer to that is probably no. Uh, that particular young lady, as I say, had a, a transplant and she had mycobacterium uh, abscessus infecting the transplant. She, she, she was going to die. They pulled out all the stops to identify specific bacteriophage that targeted her particular strain of mycobacterium abscessus. They generated, and they did this in double quick time. They produced a cocktail of those uh, bacteriophage, treated her with it, and, 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 and it worked for her. But it was a lot of effort. This is personalized medicine at its best, if you like. It was a lot of effort to treat this one patient. It was almost a proof of principle in some respects. Um, the downside of bacteriophage is they're actually quite big. They're not small molecules. They're big, big, uh, not quite organisms. They're not technically alive, but they're big lumps of protein. And if you put big lumps of protein into a living system, the immune system that I waxed lyrical about earlier recognizes these, raises antibodies against them. So generally, you can only use those kind of phage cocktails once and once only. But they're a good uh, line of last resort. Over in the ex-USSR in, in Georgia, uh, they have an entire institute which is devoted to the development of phage therapy. Would you need to simultaneously target more than one enzyme in the propionate metabolic pathway? That's a very good question, and it could apply to uh, the development of many other antibiotics. Is it better to target one key node, or is it better to target two nodes at the same time? It's always going to be better to target two nodes. And the reason for that is if resistance arises to one of them, and by the way, it will. I want to make that clear. It will. If resistance arises to one of them, you've still got the other drug in the mixture targeting the other one. So that resistant organism will still be hit by something that's active over there. The chances of getting resistance to both of those drugs, which are applied in a mixture, a combination, is much, much lower than the chance of resistance to just one of them. That's a really good question. Okay. Well, there's one here from Catherine Fan, who I believe uh, was an ex-student of mine. With COVID, uh, we're using a lot of hand sanitizers. How do you think this will affect our microbiomes? Well, it will certainly affect your skin microbiome, Catherine. Uh, the alcohol in, uh, and, and the ionic surfactants that are present in those hand sanitizers are designed to kill bacteria. So this constant cleaning uh, will, will, will certainly affect your skin microbiome, but as long as you're not imbibing them, drinking them, uh, or applying them as a cosmetic, as it were, it shouldn't affect your GI tract. And also, your skin microbiome rapidly uh, re-establishes itself, even after a good hand wash. Let's just go down. How long do you expect it will take for your particular research to bear fruit? That is a fantastic question. It's already bearing fruit. We're moving forward. We're using fragment-based drug discovery. And also, I have to say, alternative approaches, uh, 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 diversity-oriented, screening of diversity-oriented synthetic libraries and natural product libraries and so on to identify things that will kill bacteria. But that's only the first step. 
it's actually very easy to identify something which inhibits an enzyme. That's really not a problem. But once we've got that, the next steps are to make sure that that compound isn't, for example, lethally toxic to mammalian cells. It might kill bacteria, it might also kill mammalian cells. It might not bind to the same target in mammalian cells, but it might do that. It might inhibit the enzyme in vitro, but it may be that when we add it to bacterial cell suspensions, it doesn't actually get into the bacteria. Or it may be that it gets in and gets efflux straight out. It may be that such a compound is converted by the liver, and that's what the liver does, into something which is perhaps, although the original compound might not be too toxic for mammalian cells, it might get converted by the liver into something which is more toxic. That's quite common. So there are many hurdles between identifying something which acts as an inhibitor of a particular essential or conditionally essential cell process and uh, 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 that moving forward to uh, becoming something which might act as a, an antibiotic. How did resistance to the synthetic antibiotic arise? Well, that was ciprofloxacin for aquinolone and resistance arose uh, due to the mutation of the target site. Target site for ciprofloxacin is something called DNA gyrase. It plays a central role in DNA replication and it happened to pick up a mutation in the uh, quinolone binding site there, which made it insensitive to the quinolone. That's what I meant earlier by resistance will arise. Resistance, you, you, you can imagine resistance can arise to the propionate targeting antibiotics that we're developing very easily. We, we know about that. But the issue is you can live with resistance to an extent as long as that antibiotic has got a window through which it works. And ciprofloxacin has been working for us since the mid 1980s, it's not a bad antibiotic and it's still very widely used. I'll do uh, last one. Uh, let's have a look. Have any bacteria developed phage resistance in the time that we've been looking at them? Yes, uh, resistance to bacteria phage is very, very common and it arises when the bacterium mutates its surface receptors that actually recognize those bacteriophage. So when those receptors mutate, those cell surface proteins mutate, the phage can no longer recognize that bacterium and no longer binds to it. This is actually quite common. And it goes back to the issue of, yes, resistance is almost going to be inevitable, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to look for new agents, whether they're small molecules or bacteriophage or immune interventions, that will block bacteria. So we hope to run some future events. I, I think I need to I, I thank everybody that submitted questions because uh, the, the, there, there are just too many here to, to answer. I'm available on email and I think I will ask the administrators here to, to, to let you know my email when this is put online. I'll be more than happy to address any questions that people have. Um, but I've been told that I have to wind up now. I'd love to carry on talking. So I'd just like to thank you all uh, for joining us. This has been really good fun. I really enjoy talking about my work, the area in which I work, and I'm very enthusiastic about it. Please join us on social media, and um, thank you very much indeed for your attention. This has been a, a real blast, and I've, I've, I've enjoyed it, and I hope you have too. Thank you.